2003, starting with the empowerment zone for four years. I went to civil rights for two years, regulatory services for 10 years. So that's how I know a lot of these people that I consider really helpful friends. So. Wonderful. And you're originally from? Yes, I was born in Laos okay. and came to the U.S. when I was about eight years old. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. So um, just to provide a little bit of orientation regarding our program today, <clears throat> um, this is being held in recognition of Welcoming Week, uh, which is a yearly opportunity connected to September 17th, which is um, Citizenship Day or Constitution Day, the date that our uh, U.S. Constitution was signed. And during this week of Welcoming Week, we really take the opportunity to highlight ways in which we create a spirit of welcome in the spaces that we inhabit. And we celebrate and recognize the cultural heritage of inhabitants of this country. Um, this year's theme for Welcoming Week is Belonging Begins With Us, a declaration that everyone has the power to help others feel welcomed, seen, and embraced. Um, and uh, for people who may have questions as we proceed through this interview, please don't hesitate to put your questions into the chat. We will take some time at the end um, for questions and for people to share their thoughts and their, their own experiences if they would like to. Um, again, this session is being recorded, um, so please keep that in mind. And um, Noreen, you know, I'm going to be asking you some questions about your background and your immigration journey. And again, really appreciate you. I know when we hosted an event um, for Immigrant Heritage Month, you were the moderator, you were the person asking questions, and now I'm asking you some questions. So really grateful for your willingness to be interviewed today. And I wonder if you can share with our audience why you felt like it was important to talk about your own background in the context and recognition of Welcoming Week. Yeah, so, so hopefully, you know, being part of Welcoming Week, uh, just to let people know the experience really of someone coming into the country as an immigrant or refugee and you know not only they had to do it themselves but uh, with the help of people along the way organizations so by sharing my experience hopefully other people will will, will take something from it and also share their own experience not only because they came from a different country or maybe they came from a different state or came to a new job or came to a new place. So you don't have to be from a new country to make others feel welcome. Thank you so much. And I am going to start sharing my screen because we do have some slides um, with some images <clears throat> that I think will help us um, as we proceed. And just wanting to make sure if we can confirm, can can you see my slides? Can you see the slides? Can you yes. see them? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. OK, so um, Narina, we know you're from Laos um, and we have some information about um, your country. So the first slide here is um, a map of Laos and Southeast Asia, generally the countries that are around it. Can you tell us a little bit about your home country? Yeah, so Laos is in, in Southeast Asia. It's between, it's the only landlocked country in Southeast Asia. It's between Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, Burma, and, and China. So so people from the north, south, central, they, they look differently. Some could be really light skinned. Others are more darker skinned like myself. Uh, and there are about 50 ethnic groups in the country of Laos. So. Super. Thanks for sharing that. And I know that um, the history of Laos, particularly the more recent history, has a lot to do with how you ended up in the United States. Um, could you give us a little bit of context around the history that's relevant to your story, particularly yeah. the Civil War and the Secret War in Laos? So <clears throat> Laos used to be a French colony uh, from the 1800s to 1954 when it gained independence. So after 1954, a lot uh, the Western countries like the U.S. were afraid of the 
the communist domino, especially what happened to China, North Korea, and it was coming down the, the coast. So that's that's how the, the term sort of the, the secret war happened because there was a war in Vietnam, the civil war, but Laos was neutral. Uh, and there wasn't supposed to be any fighting in Laos, but the U.S. had a presence there. And you'll see the pink areas, that's called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, where North Vietnam would send troops and supplies to the south. And the U.S. had had <clears throat> had bases in Thailand, and it would send sorties, uh, planes, bombers to bomb the, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And along the way, work with the, Amer uh, the Lao royal government and multitudes of other people in Laos. So they called it the secret war. And I'm going to switch to the next slide here, which are some family photos. Can you talk, can you walk us through these photos? I know this is your family. Yeah, so, so this is my mom. The first photo on the left is uh, on the left. My father uh, worked at the Ministry of Agriculture. He was a director of agriculture. And so he worked with like uh, lots of NGOs, the, uh, the UN, World Bank, et cetera. Um, so my mom, six kids, I've, this is probably around 1974. It was probably five, six years old. There are six kids and then also my sort of brother who came to live with us uh, on the right. And the far right picture is with my mom and the six kids. Uh, without my dad, probably after uh, 1975, because <clears throat> December 1975, the Laos Civil War ended right after about six months after the, the fall of Saigon in Vietnam. So in December 1975, and the new government came and took over. Um, after the takeover, uh, people who were associated with the former government were um, sent to these re-education camps. So my father actually volunteered to go to these re-education camp to sort of learn about uh, the new system, the communist system, to get indoctrinated. Uh, but in reality, it was more like a, a, it was a political prison, a labor camp, uh, someone like the, the Russian archipelago, so something like that. You know, you would go into labor, they, sent, they were sent four to five hours away in the mountains. Some families uh, were allowed to stay with them, uh, but most of the time it was just the men and women who were soldiers, former government workers. So my dad was sent there at the end of 1975 until 1980 for five years. So at that time, we'd We'd had some, you know, the country fell, lots of poverty, the borders closed, uh, people, famine, et cetera. So you, you're pretty much on your own. Mm -hmm. Did you, were you able to see your father during that time? You said he was detained from 1975 to 1980. Did you see him? No, I did, we, we did not see him uh, from 19, I didn't see him from 1975 to until 1989, about 15 years later after we came back for a first visit. So after after he went to the, the political prison, so things got difficult for us. My mom had to go and work. She actually worked between uh, the borders of Laos and Thailand doing black you know, um, markings of bringing goods across the border. So here's a picture of uh, my father. It's kind of blurry in, in this slide, um, but you can see he's, He's a very big man. He's actually <laughs> about four foot ten. <laughs> so the only thing I, I could remember was his images of him uh, going to his office, uh, doing things with them. Um, so I, I didn't even remember what he sounded like. As a matter of fact, he, he had this southern accent because he's from the southern Laos. Imagine if you're from Minnesota and your father was from let's say Louisiana or Texas, and all of a sudden you, you meet him again, and mm -hmm. he speaks in his accent. You're like, whoa! <laughs> so that was that was a big um, big thing. And so you were pretty he, young when he was taken. Yeah, I was I was you know six seven years old, 
and didn't see him until again until 15 years later about mm -hmm. yeah and I know that, you know, sometimes when um, a family member is a focus of a government action like that, that there can be an impact on the family members as well. Um, did your family experience any challenges um, with regard to the Laotian government after your father was taken away? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I remember, you know, the, loudspeakers uh, talking about the, the new, they call it brothers, you know, coming in uh, about the new government. And but, you know, if you were associated with the old regime, you you know, I remember armed soldiers coming to our house, not with pistols, but they would carry rifles. So and, and checking up on us regularly. And of course, probably checking up on my mom because she was working across the border. Uh, bringing basic necessities like rice, salt, sugar, uh, things like that. So, so she had to go go to work, uh, do whatever it takes to survive. And so and these that, photos here, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to yeah, say so, these photos are Yeah, so you, you come to the, so th in this slide, this is the border between Laos and Thailand. The, the river is the Mekong River. It stretches from Central China to uh, to to Vietnam, so it, it's about as wide as as some of the wider parts of the Mississippi. So my, when my my mom was working between Laos and Thailand, see the first picture on the left. You know she would she would eventually plot to our escape one by one, child by child. Um, so I remember just sitting at that like restaurant or cafe on the top left and she would say coach us and say just walk down there those steps and if anything anyone question you just say um you you're the son of the, the the boat captain of the ferry boat and then once you're there it's a 10 15 minute ride across and you see those ferries those are exactly what they look like then you'd walk down about 100 steps uh during a dry season and it was during a dry season and you go across, go up another steps and she said, someone will meet you there. Um, and so that's what happened. I, so Narin, you're saying that you didn't travel as a group. It wasn't you, your mom and your other five siblings, but that you actually went individually. Can you talk more about why? Why, why did yeah, you do it that way? So really, if you were leaving during, during the day, you know, you, to escape detection, you'd have to kind of do it stealthily. One by one, some pe some families did did by night. They go by boat uh, in the quiet and darkness of the night. So in this case, my mom likely paid the border guards and the the, the ferry boat and even uh, the Thai side. So you'd have to be very coordinated, you know, to to get each and every one of us across. And it, it's scary because. One of my mom's friends, her daughter was actually shot and died when they were in a car trying to get to the border, um, shot by the border police. So it's, it was very dangerous. Yeah, you know, but when you're six, seven years old, you don't really think about stuff like that. You just, you just do. And we were talking a little bit about um, before in preparing on feeling scared and like if you actually felt scared. And one of the things that you were talking to me about was a level of uncertainty at that time. And um, I wonder if like you could share a little more about what, what it really felt like to have that sort of uncertainty around you all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, you know, so just going through all those times, I just remember my dad going away, my mom, sort of being the becoming the the mom and the dad. So you, you kind of learn to live through it. You learn to <clears throat> you have to keep quiet in those situations because you don't want to stick out, obviously. So that's and it, it becomes it becomes like a norm, you know, and that's I imagine what what it feels like with with the kids going through like the US Mexico border, what what's going on with Afghanistan you know, those uh, that chaos going on. So some of these, you don't really, 
have a chance to to sit back and reflect. You just go on instincts. Mm -hmm. so. So I'm going to move us to the next slide here. And if people can see it, uh, the um, non whoopsie, the images here of the mm -hmm. refugee camp, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's that was the actual camp where we stayed it, from from the ferry ride. Is, it was about 10 to 15 minutes. So I, I remember going um, going up to the port, probably check in, and then my brother, who was only three years older than me, ten years old, so he was he was one of those kids where you, you would collect fares and put bags on on top of the cars or in the in the trucks, and then we'd go to this camp, and probably one of my relatives took took me in, and you know, and and they have these huts on these dirt dirt fields and and roads, so either you can build your own hut. Or you can, if there was available in these concrete um, um, places, you could stay. Really, one room places. So, so, so eventually, my mom joined us uh, with with my older sister. They were the last to leave, uh, and they eventually made it. You know, for them as adults, you you check in with the police, <coughs> and of course, probably pay their way. Every everything is just, you know, you have to have resources. Uh, so, so that's our that was our hut. It was a one room grass hut with bamboo. Uh, of course, you know, with that picture, we had really nice new clothes, but we were <laughs> probably running around with old raggedy, <laughs> raggedy shorts and shirts, and sometimes bare feet. Uh, I think about it, you know, it's a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, you know, whenever there's a fire, you would run out, especially at night, uh, and wait till the, the fire is gone. When it rains, you just move out of the way uh, because the, the roof would leak. So, and how long were you there at that refugee camp? We were there for nine months. Nine months, and it depends. Your stay depends on on your sponsorship. So my mm -hmm. uncle was at the camp, and he'd gone to America settled in Hawaii and he helped sponsored us. Uh, we could have gone to to Belgium also because my, my father had a um, a co-worker from the World Bank. He he said he was willing to sponsor us, but mom mom told him, well, why don't you take her brother and his family? So they ended up in Belgium and I even got to visit them in Belgium in 1990. And eventually, also in early 90s, I would caught up with uh, with the Belgian man, uh, Mr. De Wolf. His name was De Wolf. His his wife was Iranian, and it showed us pictures, a slideshow of their life in Laos. So that was kind of mm -hmm. neat to uh, to see and talk to him eventually. Mm -hmm. so. so after you know, you did nine months in this refugee camp, and then transitioned to living in Hawaii, right? And mm -hmm. bef just before moving to Hawaii, I guess if you can share with us, like, are there, what are the most memorable things about the refugee camp that you think would be important to share? Well, just probably the the uncertainty, you know, you're, you know, as kids, you don't really think about it, but with my mom probably thinking about survival, how getting day by day, uh, you were lucky if you had some money, and some people were lucky they they had relatives that sent them money, mm -hmm. and you, you could go to you know go outside the camp to 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 get the money through the bank or something like that. Uh, the, the, that uncertainty, uh, lack of food, really housing. Um, you know there it's you'd see people, you know fights, but there were. Other things like people still celebrated, like the Lao New Year, little festivals, things like that. And life kind of goes on. Some people say they're more than a few months, maybe a few years. My wife and her family stayed in camp for about two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would just invite um, our audience, if you have questions for Narin, um, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. I can't see them right now as I'm going through this slide presentation, but we will take some time at the end. 
um, for people's questions. And then if people have observations that they'd like to share too. So these next couple of slides um, are images of your family, um, including in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk us through a little bit of that, these, your family members, your life in Hawaii, that transition from um, your yeah. home country to the United yeah. States. So eventually we, we ended up in Hawaii in 1978. I was in the, right before my third grade year. Um, we, my uncle and his wife picked us up, the, this, the eight of us, my mom, six kids, and my mom's youngest brother, he also came with us. So we stayed in this two bedroom apartment for a few months uh, for probably, I think the summer. We came in May, 1978. Uh, we stayed with them for the summer and then we moved to her house. Uh, it's quite different. Uh, I just remember, you know, being in the camp, you're, you basically have no rules. You know, we're roaming around as kids and then you come to this place, it's almost like paradise. Uh, Hawaii is predominantly Asian Pacific Islander. So that was a uh, fairly easy transition with going to school because most of the kids were, uh, you know, darker hair, darker skin. But then yet, you know, we had to learn the language. Uh, we get in a lot of fights. I just remember getting into fights on myself, my brothers, sisters, because the kids know, they know when if you're new and they, they would pick on you. But, you know, us being in the camps, we were, we used to all that fighting, you know, punching, kicking. <laughs> <laughs> so after they fight you and then they become your best friends. So mm -hmm. that's that's how it went with us. It, and this uh, photograph of your family here. Yeah. So this is about 1981. I was probably in the, the fifth grade. Uh, so and my yep. sister is in, in the back. So I'm Chan, she's. You know, the, the previous picture was most a tribute to her. Um, she was six years older, you know, being a single mom with my mom. So my sister was more like a, kind of like a second mom to us. She to take care of us. She was already a teenager when she came. So a lot of times is you come as immigrants or refugees and, you know, the, the children become sort of take on these, these roles too, added roles of, of adults. You just you just, uh, yeah, they, they take on added burdens because mm -hmm. my mom had work. She worked at the tofu factory, the hotel, maid service, uh, housekeeper. And then eventually she opened a restaurant with her brother in 1982. And you know, the situations get better, but you still, I just remember we moved on. We moved around a lot just because it, a large family and um, <clears throat> with landlords and so it's but yeah are there things about um that transition were there things that helped you with the transition positive things that made the transition to life in the united states easier that you would say helped you achieve success yeah you know luckily there were lots of people and organizations that were there to help us you know my uncle was there and um uh, I remember the, uh, the one of the organizations, I think it was Catholic Charities, and you know, they would take us to get clothes and things like that. And, um, and teachers along the way, my third grade teacher, I still, fourth grade teacher, I still remember their names. Uh, Mrs. Miyashiro, third grade, Mrs. Nowaki, fourth grade. Mrs. Nowaki, the fourth grade teacher, teacher before I went on, she even took me and other students, Chung Su Chao, during the summer before our fourth grade year. She would take us to the museum. I remember going to see the first movie, The Muppets, uh, and go to McDonald's and go hang out at the beach. So people like that and organizations, you know, make you really think about how they made you feel welcome and help you along the way. So. And I know that the transition to Hawaii, I mean, certainly you've made your way to Minnesota, but there was another step, right? So you spent yeah, some time yeah. in Virginia and you were quite young when you kind of did that on your own. Can can you talk to us a little bit about that? It seems like quite an unusual life for um, a, uh, a freshman in high school. Yeah, so 
I, I guess, you know, I mean, to my mom, it didn't seem like a big deal. Uh, she thought, you know, with six kids in Hawaii, sometimes we were getting maybe getting into too much trouble. So she sent us one by one away again. <laughs> this time, first, my brother went, older brother went to Virginia. And he, he two years later, he came back to visit. And she'd ask me, OK, you, you want to go and, and see? I said, yeah, sure, why not? I'm, you know, when you're that young, you don't really think about it. You, you'd hear stories, watch TV and movies about, about the mainland. We call, it, we call it the mainland. You know, my, like, my eighth grade teacher, she would talk about Mrs. Tajiri. Her life at Ohio State, how it was, she went to the lake, just hanging out at the lake and do, after classes. I thought, wow. Seems cool. I'll try it out. Uh, so I went to Virginia. Uh, me and my brother, <clears throat> he came and I went with him. Flew to Virginia for my to start my ninth grade year. Yeah. And how did that? How was that? What was your situation like? Uh, it was coming from Hawaii to Virginia. It was otherworldly. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was. Awesome. It was a kind of a shell shock. First the weather, and then, and then my aunt picks picks us up. We we go to um, to her apartment. It was a three story apartment, two bedroom. She she had three kids, uh, from three years old to twelve years old. Um, they stayed in one room, <laughs> and then in another room, I stayed in another room. She had a boarder. It was an older gentleman, Lao man. He was probably in his sixties. So I shared that room with him. There was a king size bed. He has one side and, and I take the other side. So, uh, and then the weather, it was hard to get used to the weather, really cold. Um, and on top of that, I stayed at home for about a month or two before going to school, just because of the, the, the school processing, um, uh, you know. So, so that, was, that, was a, that was a shocker. <laughs> and, and I know that, that mm -hmm. go ahead yeah on top of that you know we didn't realize my mom probably didn't realize, realize too that my aunt um, was seriously ill she had breast cancer and she ended up passing away in around March my freshman year so after she passed away so either I go back to Hawaii or stay somewhere in Virginia So, and I know that there is someone who was um, associated with your school, I think, too, who played a role in, uh, in supporting you while you were in Virginia as well. It's someone who you've remained close to since yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. So l luckily, you know, my, my wrestling coach, he was a volunteer coach. He, he was a lawyer with the federal government in Washington, D.C. So my mom asked him if, if I could stay with him and... My brother had already stayed, was already staying there with him. Um, so it's kind of a joke. We we just say, well, yeah, we we adopted the white man, and became our family. <laughs> so I ended up staying, going and staying with him, and then you know, uh, which, which is much for the better. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting my own room, uh, even had a bathroom, um, and he was not only my my wrestling coach, but you know, he became like a, a second father, father figure. He'd help me through to high school and visit colleges, uh, uh, help pick a college. Eventually, I ended up at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrestled there um, as part of the, the, the school. So th things worked out much, much better from then on. Mm -hmm. So I know that you went to college, graduated in 1992, um, became a naturalized U.S. citizen at age 18, and um, that you still, you know, retained a desire to find a place where you really belonged. And it sounds like that took you back to Laos, uh, where you ended up living yeah. for several years. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of factors coming to the U.S. at a young age, you're not having your father. So you, in the back of your mind, you, you know, you always, I always think about, okay, what, what, it, what could have been, and there's a sense of, of belonging, 
you know, you don't feel like you're American, you, you know, and, and then you start thinking about, okay, what if I was to go back and see? So that's what happened. I went back to Laos, 1992 to 96, and worked with my father. He, he had come out and he was working in the coffee industry, doing import and export. And my mom had also gone back too, and she had gone back and forth. So I decided I'd go and, 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 and work there and mostly get to know him and, and kind of try to figure things out. And, you know, mostly just to see, okay, what kind of find out, you know, what kind of person he was and why he, he had stayed behind while we, we left, so. And, and I know that you were sharing about how, like, there are some things that felt very familiar there, right? Like, you told me before that you went back to the house that you were born in or that you spent some years in, but then yeah, also yeah. you felt Americanized. Can you talk a little bit about that dynamic? Yeah, so so I went back and I lived in the, in the same house I was actually born in. You know, back then you, you were not born in a hospital, so you don't have birth certificate. My my aunt, my my dad's sister, actually, she was a midwife or nurse. So that was really the first time I felt like I belong somewhere, you know, having a place of your own. So that's something you, I think a lot of immigrants and refugees feel, feel in that you don't really have a sense of belonging until you really own something set roots, have a family or something like that. So mm -hmm. that's that's what it felt like. It, it felt good. Mm -hmm. it felt good. But you left. Yeah. Left. <laughs> I spent four years there. Uh, things didn't work out. And I hadn't saved much money, although I got, you know, got to spend time with, with my dad more, my mom. So there was a, and my grandmother, both grandmothers, on my dad's side and my mom's side and, and other relatives. But eventually, so my dad left, he retired from the coffee industry. So I had to figure to do something. So I came back to Hawaii. So I decided, okay, you know, by the time I'm 30, I better do something, have a career or maybe have a secondary degree. So I at least find some gainful employment besides working at the family restaurant. So I ended up, Going back to school, got a, a MBA in China and Japan, international business. Got to spend a half a year in Japan. And I thought I was going to stay in Japan too. But I ended up coming back and to Hawaii and eventually ended up in Washington, D.C. working for a Southeast Asian advocacy organization, working with refugees. Mm -hmm. And that was quite the experience. To this day, the most gratifying work I've, I've ever done. Can you it's, talk about why? Yeah, it felt like I was giving back to the community, mm -hmm. helping people integrate, uh, working with people, really great people, help, helping other, others um, um, become Americans. And, um, you know, one of the more memorable things I, I remember doing was traveling to Boston to work with the Lao family. Uh, who, who had a grandfather who had died. He, he was actually killed um, as a result of a hate crime. So working with them, working with the authorities, um, and helping them through the, the, the whole process was, and, and working with other immigrants too, like Iraqis in Chicago, uh, Ethiopians in the DC area, Haitians in South Florida, the Hmong community in, in Fresno, Vietnamese in Houston. So I did a lot of travel and get to meet all these great people and hear their stories, really. So, their, their stories about coming to America, being in America, uh, how they survive, how they thrive, and becoming Americans and, and work with the help of many other people and organizations on the way that made them feel welcome. Wonderful. Can you can you talk a little bit about um, the process of becoming a Minnesotan for you? Uh, what was it that led you to the city of Minneapolis? Yeah, yeah. It's created so, a sense of belonging here for you. So, you know, so I went from Laos to Hawaii to Virginia, then 
to min to Minnesota. And go from warm, colder, colder. Now it's like cold, mm -hmm. really cold. So maybe the next place I'll go is Alaska, right? <laughs> <laughs> but so I came in 2003. Uh, when I was working in Washington D.C., we had an we supported an organization, uh, a local nonprofit. So I came to do a site visit and and met my my wife, you know. And we'd know, known each other for a few months, but I, I knew, yeah, I knew. So, uh, so I said, she's the one. So I, so during one of my visits, I, I applied for a job, um, and I came for interview for the city, and that was the only job I applied for. I came for an interview. I remember, two thousand two, the winter of two thousand three, was like a big snowstorm. So. <laughs> So I've been here since 2003, since then, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we were talking about like having a sense of belonging and you know, you had experience that in Laos being in the house that you were born in and sort of uh, how did you rediscover that here in the United States, in Minnesota? Yeah, so this is the longest place I've been, 18 years now. I've spent mm -hmm. 12 years in Laos, another year in, in in Thailand, some in Japan, 12 in Virginia. So, you know, having a job, buying a home, having family, being a part of the community, uh, working. And then that, I think, you know, that, that tends sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. I think once that's, and my kids, they, this is the life that they know. And for me, mm -hmm. even going back to Laos, you know, the, this slide here, I went to, back to visit uh laos last time was 2016 and my dad is in the far right and steve is right behind him they my wrestling coach and my my wife and daughters and my dad's new family so he's been married actually twice and my mom never remarried so that's mm -hmm. that's a sad part uh, he's come to visit us a few times um, but it's, it's not the same so you know it's you have that it's just that feeling that that empty feeling what of what could have been. So that's mm -hmm. that always kind of stays with you. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. And you know, if we talk about um, the sense of belonging and thinking about how belonging begins with us, there, there's a component of it that is each of us and what we do um, and the actions that we take in our lives. But then there's also how other people act and how other people make us feel welcome or help create that sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. um, Noreen, we're really grateful for um, sharing so much of your life with us today. I'm curious about um, how your experiences have had an influence on your career, on how you conduct your life, on how you interact with other people. Yeah, you know, I think about like especially what's happening with uh, Afghanistan, how, you know, the, in, even the southern borders, people coming in and eventually we'll see people from Afghanistan here. We've seen people from, from Iraq. Uh, we've seen people coming from Central America, South America, and just how this is a situation that I went through and, and other people too who went through the same thing, um, you know, and how they they did it and and others helped them along the way so and and with the work that we do today i just think about you know treating people with with dignity uh you know regardless um trying to a position you know where a lot of immigrants and refugees come from it's 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 an auto authoritarian um countries where they distrust authorities police government so we as public officials, I think, can, can can help them along that path to to become, you know, more trusting of public entities. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I'm actually at this moment just going to put a little link into the chat, you know, as part of our welcoming week celebration um we do have a little survey you know where you can share your own um welcoming experience of how you've made others feel welcome or how you felt welcome um 
or I felt a sense of belonging based on how someone interacted with you. Um, and you can share your thoughts on making um, Minneapolis a more um, welcoming city. Uh, I would invite people to, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Narin to please put them in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand. I just want to say for Narin, um, thank you so much for allowing us to share in your own refugee experience. I know that you know when we see a successful and accomplished individual, um, it's 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 you don't immediately think of um, a frightened seven-year-old crossing a river by himself um, to go into a refugee camp, and um, it's so important to share these stories, uh, origin stories that really have led to who um, who people become. Um, as adults, I guess as we reflect on the meaning of welcoming week um, and a new opportunity for us to welcome people seeking refuge, including, as you've said, Afghanistan, do you have any last words or thoughts that you'd like to share about the concept of belonging and welcome? Yeah, you know, I, I think I want to thank the the audience, my co-workers and people for joining us. And, you know, I, I think we do a great job here in the city of welcoming um, immigrants, refugees, newcomers. Uh, there are other hundreds, thousands of other people like like myself who have this story. So you never know. Even though you're not a newcomer, you could be from uh, coming from a new state, uh, new town, new city. So just the idea of making others feel welcome. Uh, uh, you don't have to be super friendly, but just saying hello, saying their name, asking how they're doing. And I think that's that goes a long ways. Thanks so much. And um, thank you all to the audience for people who are making comments into the chat. Really grateful. As, as we mentioned at the outset, this session is recorded and will be made available to city employees, including people who couldn't be with us today. We're very grateful that you're able to celebrate Welcoming Week uh, this week with us. I do just want to highlight um, a couple of additional um, Welcoming Week activities this afternoon at 4.30 in conjunction with the City of St. Paul. We'll be hosting a bi-weekly immigration forum where we'll talk about a, um, an initiative to promote immigrant and refugee inclusion called Gateways for Growth and also share um, immigration-focused updates. Um, this Thursday, in conjunction with the city's celebration of Hispanic or Latino Latinx Heritage Month, there will be a Spanish 101 session with um, City of Minneapolis employee Justo Garcia. That's Thursday at noon. You can find that event and all the Latino Heritage Month uh, programming on the Somos SharePoint site. Um, on Friday, uh, check out the city on um, the city's Facebook page for um, a How to Become a U.S. Citizen webinar, also in conjunction with City of St. Paul and Immigration Legal Service Partners. And I am just going to put a little bit of information in the chat on the topic of Afghan evacuees and how to provide um, assistance and support. There is a um, national web page now. It's welcome.us. Um, which is a way to channel um, support that people have to offer. I'm just putting that into the chat right now. There's also through the State Department of Human Services, a gov delivery um, uh, newsletter where if people locally are interested in offering support and just finding out how can, they can be of help, um, that's a, a place to go to get regular updates. So finally, I'd like to say this is the second in a series of conversations. The first one um, took place during Immigrant Heritage Month, where we invite city staff to share information about their own background. Um, and if you are interested in um, having future conversations, participating, leading, um, doing a panel discussion, if you have ideas, um, please don't hesitate to contact Narin or myself. I'm just going to put my contact information into the chat. And Narin, if you'd like to add your info to, or if you'd like me to add your info, um, okay. feel free. Yeah. yeah. And Michelle, I want to add if, if the audience want to 
chime in, they have a story, or just want to talk about the work that they do or the experience, please feel free. So, so, a lot of people here work with immigrants or refugees and, and have their own stories too. We really appreciate the comments that people have made in the chat. Um, we're really grateful for your participation today. Um, if you have thoughts that you'd like to share or questions, um, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat. At this moment, we'll actually stop the recording just for the last couple of minutes. Um, so, uh, so because I think that I think that we're good and we can wrap with this right now. So I'll just stop the recording right now. Just one second. Let me figure out how to do it.